welcome. You're listening to episode 37 of Pause and Play, the Preventivet podcast. On today's show, Kathy and I are joined by special guest, certified dog trainer and founder of Positive Transformations, Jennifer Anderson. We talk about how to create a safe space for the kids and for the dogs in your home, especially now that everyone is pretty much home all the time. It's an incredibly important topic, and we'll definitely be having Jennifer back for more. And now, let's start the show. Welcome back to another episode of Pause and Play, the Preventivet podcast. I am your co-host, Mia, and I've got Preventivet certified dog trainer, Kathy Madsen, here with me. How are you doing, Kathy? Good. How are you, Mia? Oh, you know, trying to decide whether or not I have allergies, a cold, or coronavirus. I know, Um, right? It's crazy. Doing okay. Uh, And we also have a very special guest here with us today, uh, Jennifer Anderson from Positive Transformation, who specializes in family-friendly dog training. And this is an incredibly uh, important topic right now since we are all quarantined. So Jennifer, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here today. How, how are you doing in all this madness? Realistically, it's pretty tough. Um, I do try to find the silver linings throughout the day. And if I get a few minutes throughout the day to forget about everything, uh, those are nice little glimmers of hope. That's for sure. But Absolutely. it's definitely a mental and physical game that's happening every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I keep going in kind of like waves where I'm like, I'm okay. And then all of a sudden I'm like, I'm not okay. <laughs> and I think that's totally realistic. And we need to embrace that and and uh, be kind to ourselves. Yeah, definitely. Uh, great point. So is there anything like special that's been taking your your mind off of things? Any shows you've been able to get away from it all with? Um, No shows, pretty much just trying to find a beam of sunlight in my house and (laughs) sitting there for 15 to 20 minutes and and actually just trying to relax and and feel the warmth and oh yeah it's like my um, dog yeah exactly (laughs) yes exactly I feel like a cat um (laughs) but you know in the end it does feel quite nice Mm -hmm. Um, and normally we just feel like we're multitasking so much that we don't take that time for ourselves and that's really important to kind of recharge yeah Kathy how about you have you been getting any sunshine Yes, I'm lucky that I live in the Green Lake area here in Seattle. And so it's really, well, yesterday was nicer than today. Um, So we took a nice, long, socially distanced walk, um, did a sniffari with uh, my dog, Sookie, um, who misses you, Mia. Oh, I miss Sookie too. Yeah. And so, yeah, Jennifer's so right. It's like just getting some sunshine and that vitamin D is a big mood booster. But other than that, I've just kind of been... uh, you know, playing the Nintendo Switch because uh, I'm super cool. And uh, and then just kind of spending extra time with Sookie. Like all the snuggle time is, I think pets were just made for this moment. You yes. Know? They're, so, they're so great to have as just kind of a distraction from from everything that's going on. So, Well, and I think that a lot of people have really like embraced that. Um, you know, like a lot of the shelters have been cleared and have been, uh, there's a lot of, you know, like the foster programs have been really big. And then like, I know Kathy, you said, and, I, and I've seen the same thing. A lot of our friends have been getting new puppies. <laughs> so many. Oh my goodness. On social media this weekend, so many people were like, look at my new puppy. And yeah. I'm like, oh, we need to talk to get you prepared. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. And especially if you have kids. Um, so Jennifer, this is, this is really where you come in. And um, so first, I'd like to start with what I guess got you started in all of this. Um, I started off as a registered vet tech for about 10 years. And over that period of time, I became more and more into behavior when it came to how to decrease the stress overall. Um, And it came to dogs coming into the veterinary hospital. Um, Along that road, I found a puppy who needed a home. She was being spayed at the veterinary clinic I was working in. And we instantly connected and I had to have her. Um, come to find out she was found on the side of the highway at about three months Mm. of age. Um, I took her into my arms and realized, oh boy, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, she's going to need some work. Uh, She had missed a lot in her life. I didn't know exactly what it was that she had missed. I only had kind of some guesses, but she really needed 
help along the way. I wanted to do my best to understand her and figure out how to help her fully. Yeah. Um, and she became my inspiration. I, um, it's been about a little over two years since she's passed. Uh, she lived to about 14. Um, and she's it's never like, enough time, no matter what. <laughs> no, right? I mean, that's why I sit here today is, is to honor her, um, Bali, miss her terribly. Um, but she was my inspiration really for taking the plunge and, and launching my business, Positive Transformation. Um, I turned her into my logo. I've done a few uh, single cartoon frames and designed them to look like her in mm-hmm. honor of her to help propel some change for the the greater good. Um, that's wonderful. Because I mean, I think a lot of, there's a very romantic notion of what dog ownership is going to be like. And right. I think not everybody does prepare and then things happen. So, you know, especially when it comes to dogs and children, what brought you into that side to be like, there's, there's a lot of information, obviously missing people are doing things wrong. There's a lot of bite cases happening, or, you know, there, you see all this rehoming happening. What I guess got you interested in family friendly, uh, specific stuff. I love answering this question because I don't feel that the woman who led me along this path um, really recognizes how she changed my life. Um, The woman's name is Madeline Gabriel. Uh, She's a certified pet dog trainer. Um, Her business is Dogs and Babies Learning. And I met her in line for lunch at a continuing education seminar in San Francisco. Uh, She was speaking to somebody about how she was doing educational classes for humans only on dogs and babies. And I just immediately took to her. And this was before I was a mother myself. And I said, hi, I'm Jennifer (laughs) Anderson. (laughs) Who are you? Please tell me more. And so long story short, um, I ended up relocating from Northern California to the San Diego region where she was actually working at the time. And she kind of took me under her wing and I became her little birdie and just kind of absorbed everything um, that I saw and, you know, went to her seminars, did some private in-home training classes with her. And I just was like, yes, where has this been? You know, we think about, um, you know, how we choose car seats, um, you know, how we prepare safety devices in our home so our, our children stay safe. But what about our family dog? And so I've always been very excited to share Madeline Gabriel's name because she was the one that led me into dogs and babies. That's awesome. And Kathy, how did you're the one that introduced me to Jennifer? So how did how did that relationship happen? Well, so we met goodness a couple years ago now, just through kind of networking with some local dog trainers in our area in the North Seattle area. And I I love Jennifer because I have referred many a client to her when they are like, I'm expecting a baby. What do I do? And I'm like, I know someone who specializes in this. Please call Positive Transformation. Um, so. I've just and that's positive, positive. Just so everybody knows, it's positive. P A W. Positive. Way, right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so she she's been just a great resource for me to share with clients um, because it is such a big transition. And I think as dog culture has changed since, I mean, when I was a kid decades ago, um, you know, it's different now where the dogs are more of a part of the family, which is fantastic. And they're inside and you're, you're sharing a lot more um, in the home with them. And so this transition of how do I introduce my dog to a brand new baby? You know, how do I make sure everything's safe? How do I prevent um, bites and things from happening and making sure that my dog is happy and stress-free during this big change too. I think that's such an important topic uh, to focus on for families and, and everyone out there with dogs now. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, Jennifer, I hope that you'll come back to actually like do like cover that topic specifically, the, um, the what to expect when you're expecting kind of a thing. (laughs) Even, even yesterday uh, I was telling Kathy on my, um, French Bulldog Facebook group, somebody posted and was asking for advice because his, um, wife is due in August. And so they want to start getting their 
prepared. And, you know, I'm always so happy to see that like proactive um, right. stuff. And so early, place. like yeah. that's fantastic. Cause a lot of times people are like, uh, we're due next week. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I'm what like, time is it? <laughs> at least, at least you do it before the baby's home, you know, <laughs> yeah. but, but getting people aware, like you can plan ahead, you know, and it'll make your life that much easier. Cause you're going to be exhausted when you bring a baby home. <laughs> so Right. I mean, I I look at it as, you know, just I I would love for people to uh, learn the education right when they start taking all their classes on, you know, to to birth a baby or how to care for a baby. I mean, it's just part of that second and, and third trimester of pregnancy is when I would like people to start. Yeah. yeah, And I think it's important too. And oh my gosh, we could have so many podcasts with you, Jennifer, where it's, it's like I had Sookie who's 10 now and I didn't have a child in the home until just recently when me and my boyfriend moved in together and there's now a seven-year-old, right. you know? So it's even if, if you don't have kids right now, learning these things ahead of time can be really beneficial for when a child is there all of a sudden, you know, in my situation. You right. Know? right. So and and the, pa- you know, the adults are learning um, up-to-date practice as well. Um, because, you know, over time, just like with behavior training, we we're continually learning um, what's recommended and what's up-to-date and, and something that, you know, I maybe practiced as a child, you know, way long ago, um, definitely is outdated by now. And so it's helpful for the adults to learn as well. Totally. Definitely. Now that we're forced to like be home all the time and all these people are bringing these puppies in, what's the top thing that you would want parents of of kids and dogs to know when it comes to like day-to-day life right now since we're on top of each other? (laughs) Yeah, I think um, when we start to put um, the way that we feel in this moment um, up front and we're honest with ourselves... Um, you know, I'm a mom, I have a seven-year-old and a soon-to-be four-year-old. And, you know, I find myself running into the backyard and, and just sitting for a moment in, in peace and quiet, um, or maybe even being in the bathroom and, and, and locking the door and hanging out for an extra few minutes just to try to, to relax and to recharge. Um, I think that our dogs need that too. I mm-hmm. think that um, it's important for them to have, um, usually I recommend two different areas within the home um, where they can actually go there voluntarily if they choose so to not be bothered. And that might be not have toys thrown about right um, in front of their bed or not to have uh, people walking by or, or maybe just to be even looked at and talked to. Um, I think that they need their own downtime um, as well. And, um, I think that some dogs don't know how to seek that refuge as well. Um, you know, my husband, he'll say, why don't you go relax for a little bit? (laughs) What do you, you know, what do you mean? He can see that the tension and the stress in my body. And, um, I think that a lot of times that's overlooked with our family dogs. We just love them so much, or maybe they seem extra cuddly and, and they're not willing to leave our side, but really it's important for them to to have their alone time too. And so we might actually have to, to physically guide them to those um, areas of rest, kind of like a little spa retreat for them. Yeah. And I can imagine that being like really beneficial in the long run anyway, just in terms of like not having separation anxiety and like feeling okay independently. Like right. this I is mean, a good thing. <laughs> yeah, we're, we definitely shifted quickly into this new way of life. And, you know, we're all hoping that it shifts like, again back to kind of some type of normalcy. Yeah, uh, where, yeah where schools and, and jobs resume and then our dogs um, go back to what is normal. But I think humans and dogs are going to have to learn that process of, of starting over. Um, and, you know, we might see some cases of separation anxiety that we didn't think would happen. And that's where Kathy comes in because I know that uh, that's what she specializes in. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Yeah. I've been talking a lot um, with people about preventing it now, especially with the puppies that are coming home that people have adopted. It's kind of like, well, how do I, and it's so much easier to prevent than to treat later on. It's like, well, how do I leave them alone if I'm at home all the time? And I'm like, seriously, go get in your car one, turn on your car so that, you know, the battery still works and then drive like around the block and park and read a book, you know, play Candy Crush for 10, 15 minutes and then go home, you know, and while you're gone, you know, your puppy's working on 
stuffed Kong, they have meals, things like that, where it's like you're teaching them that being alone is pretty great, you know, and giving them a break from you. And then you're also getting a break from puppy. <laughs> Sometimes right. puppies are stressful. So you can create some alone time without actually having to go to work, um, you know, or go for your midday walk to get that sunshine outside, get that vitamin D in and don't bring your puppy, which you shouldn't be doing anyway if they're not fully vaccinated um, and ready to go out on leashed walks. So there are ways to to prevent that separation anxiety. And I think using those safety zones that Jennifer talks about, um, we talk about safe spaces, which are the same thing. I love that, but I also love Jennifer's point of having more than one. It's not something that I've really thought about with my dog, but with our home setup, it would actually be easier if I set up an extra one for her so that wherever she's at in that moment, she knows it's, it's close, you know, and and she can go over there. So. so Yeah. I I mean, you know, sometimes I I feel a little stress and I have a favorite chair in our family room and I sit in there and I feel a, a sense of relaxation, but then sometimes I really need to get away. And that's when I retreat to my master bedroom and master <laughs> bath. And, and I, I look at it as, as that's my zone one is in the family room. Zone two is the master bedroom. And so um, I like for dogs to have that option too, because it might just be, oh, I, you know, I want to be an extra few feet away, but still see what's going on. And they can have that bed. Um, you know, in the family room or, or adjacent to that family room kitchen area. But then it's like, well, where's the other spot where I really <laughs> need to like chill out and relax and, and decrease the volume and, and decrease the movement and, and the vibrations, all of that. Right. And well, that's a great point. So would you say that like crates can be used if the dog likes their crates? Are those good options for these safety zones for them? Or, or do you prefer more of an open space? Uh, for me, a lot of times um, I'm working with so many families that have children um, and just some dogs don't necessarily like a crate or maybe it's not the correct type of crate, right. um, even just the size of crate. Um, so a lot of times I'm a big believer in baby gates. Uh, yeah. Baby gates, <clears throat> excuse me, can go, you know, just in a doorway where if you have an open family room kitchen area. And then there's a a side room, like a dining room that never gets used, (laughs) you know, that (laughs) baby gate can go there. And then the dog bed is placed on the other side of the baby gate. And just as a rule of thumb, you know, as a mom, I'll stick my arms through that gate and make sure that I can't reach the dog bed. So I know that if I'm in the kitchen, busy making dinner or doing dishes and my kids are running like crazy and they go to reach for the dog, that they actually can't even get close to the dog bed. And so, um, it alleviates my worries. It, I hope, makes the dog feel safer and more relaxed. Right. And, you know, we all can catch a breather. Yeah. So, yes, uh, baby gates for sure. I swear, as a dog trainer, having gone to a lot of in-homes, I see my death someday being tripping over a pet gate or baby gate because I cannot. <laughs> there's so many ways for those things to open and close that I'm like, I can't figure this out. So I step right. over it. Well, and it's just <laughs> doing what I do, there's a particular brand that I actually recommend because it is very user friendly and it is quite sturdy. Yeah. What brand, brand is, is that? that? <laughs> <laughs> Tell um, me. Yeah. So the, the brand is actually Dream Baby. And I recommend the extra tall auto close. And so the extra tall at its tallest is about 42 inches high. So it's really uh, user friendly for adults. You're not having to like hunch over and lean over. Um, The gate itself, um, when you undo the little lock at the top of that 42 inches, swings open both directions. So it doesn't matter which way you're going. You can just um, choose the, the direction that you prefer to open it. And then at the, the base of that gate that opens, there's a button that um, plugs into the bottom horizontal bar. Um, so dogs can't kind of push their way through the bottom, you know, like um, sometimes <laughs> dogs would do. And so um, it's very user friendly. Um, and also aesthetically, it's pleasing to the eye because I think a lot of times we are out of the time in our life where we really need a baby gate because we don't have children in the environment that are uh, new walkers or crawlers. And so you're like, oh, I just, I don't have kids that age anymore. I just did a remodel. And it's like, well, this, you can choose white or black. Uh, it kind of looks like wrought iron. Uh, nice. They're vertical slats. So the dogs have, have very um, limited ways of crawling over it. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so dream baby gate, extra tall, auto close. Love it. I'm going to go, I'm going to go get one. 
<laughs> yeah, I asked because as somebody without children, I have like more baby gates than I ever thought I would own. Because <laughs> with right. my two dogs, they both have their like uh, one uh, one stays in the kitchen when we're out, and the other one has uh, her own room, and uh, they're all different. And let me tell you, when you talk about dogs that like will kind of dig out of their she has, she's over 10 years old. She has rear uh, myeliopathy, so no full use of her back legs. And this girl, this mm-hmm. little pug pushed her way out of the baby gate yeah. from one side. It's amazing. So yeah. I'm excited to hear about um, this dream baby. Yeah. Mabel <laughs> is a determined little pug. She certainly <laughs> is. Yeah. There needs to be a, a book written about her. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So... Um, yeah, go ahead. Jennifer, like other than the safe spaces and those safety zones, what are other issues that you could see being more of a problem right now with kids being home all day? Um, I would think that um, they just can't leave the dogs alone or they're giving dogs hugs and invading the dog's space. And some dogs will voluntarily go up to children and kind of close that gap, just trying to express child go away. But most people don't understand body language um, that the dog is actually saying, can you please give me space? I'm so Um, glad that you brought body language up because this is something that I think would be a great refresher for everybody. It might even be the first time people are learning. Right, right. I mean, I look at it as vitally important, even if you don't have a dog in your household, you know, every third home in Seattle does. Um, you know, a family member has a dog, your neighbor does next door. And so it's important to really fully understand um, what a dog's, <clears throat> excuse me, current emotional state is versus just banking on the guardian um, or owner saying, oh, their dog's really good with their grandkid. I want um, children and adults um, to be like, oh, wow, wait a minute. I see a big exaggerated yawn with ears pinned back and whale eye and the dog is going tense. And you're like, well, why is my dog acting this way to the the neighbor child? And that way you can kind of take the right step within that moment versus banking on, well, the dog was always good before, right? I'm generally a nice person, (laughs) but you catch me in a mood or maybe I'm simply not feeling good because my aches and pains are flaring up that day, you know? Or, you know, you don't know that person. (laughs) So right, it's like, right. yeah, the familiarity is, is important too, mm-hmm. you know, and I love this because it, it really is talking about advocating for your dog mm-hmm. and making sure that they're feeling okay with what's going on, you know, so even if they might be okay with your own, you know, grandchild, meeting another child might be different for them. And so you have to advocate for them. And then by doing that, you're keeping everybody safe. Yeah. And I think with the children, you know, if we guide them in a way that is fun and rewarding for the child, it's like, wow, if, if you can tell that this dog really likes what you're doing or dislikes, think of the bond that will form between you as a child and that dog, um, as opposed to it just being forced or you thinking that it's actually occurring. It's like, you can truly understand that in this moment, your dog is really enjoying your company. Yeah. And I think that's just fantastic, yeah. you know, that you can fully have a, an understanding that you're having a wonderful time. So when you work with kids, what are the main body language signals from the dog that, that you focus on to let them know the dog's enjoying this versus the dog might not be enjoying mm-hmm. this? Um, before we even get to that point, usually what I'm doing is teaching children how to say hello to dogs. Yes. That's okay. A, that's so important. <laughs> so, you know, many years ago, we used to stick out our fist and walk towards a dog. Um, and I think that there's a, a safer option to that. Um, and so when my own son was about three, um, I started teaching him to stop and to wave hi. And I did that with our own family dog, Bali. So it's like, oh, you know, Bali's walking across uh, the family room and Gabriel shows interest in her on his own. Gabriel's my son. And I say, Gabriel, stop and wave hi. And so he would just, hi, Bali. Uh, and I would repeat that over and over again, just teaching him that in order to say hi, we stop what we're doing and we wave hi versus running up and touching. Yes. Um, and so it wasn't, don't do this. It was 
uh, Gabriel, do this instead. This <laughs> makes Bali feel happy. This makes Bali feel safe. Oh and gosh. So that, 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 that's like the very first step is just, um, teaching them the right way to say hi. And then everybody says, Oh, my dog would never. Mm. And I'm hoping that's the case, but how we compare it to something different within the home is, well, we always teach our children, please. And thank you at the dinner table. And then they go over your aunt's house and it's please. And thank you there. Then they go to grandma's and it's please. And thank you. So eventually when you go to a restaurant and your child orders something and they say, thank you. Like, yes, I've done it right. It just becomes the child's default be- default behavior. And There's so, so when- many connections with dog training and child training here. <laughs> right. that I'm and, just and, like, and, wow. Yeah. And so imagine this, you know, my son who's three, who's stopping and waving hi to Bali over and over and over again on a daily basis. Now he does that on walks. And now here's the part that's going to blow your mind because I didn't realize it until I lived it. My son, who's about four and a half, okay, now starts teaching his 18 month old baby sister to stop and wave hi. That's so, yes. Great. So, as my daughter goes up to my dog, he says, No, Grace, stop and wave hi. Aww. And guess what? She started to get it. Mm-hmm. So, I realized <laughs> that children can learn even sooner. Uh huh. So that's step one, the long winded step one. (laughs) Yeah, that was perfectly winded. (laughs) (laughs) So around like what age would you say would be an appropriate time to get involved in training sessions? So with children in the environment and and the child actually kind of um, doing some hands-on work, I would recommend five years of age and older. So they have that um, motor skills that have been developing since birth. Yeah. And would you say that that would be, I mean, at least in my training, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm always learning new things. What I usually have kids do, um, even older kids, um, five and up into early teens, is I don't usually have them give treats from the hand. I usually have them toss the treat to the dog. Mm -hmm. Would you have kids, like younger kids especially, start with really kind of the more hands-off training of like, okay, I'm going to pour your meal into the Kong um, or your little puzzle. And then I put it down and I go away. Or would you have them actually working certain behaviors and things? Right. Cause they want to be involved. It, you know, it's going to be impossible to not have right. them involved. <laughs> right. And, and I think a great way to show love to dogs and ways that dogs appreciate is by giving them some mental stimulation. So um, Kathy, the classic Kong that you bring up, Um, That's definitely a recommendation. And so what I've done is I've made a handout for children and adults to follow on how to utilize the dog's normal food to stuff a Kong. And so um, the child can learn the beginner level of stuffing a Kong. And then once the dog gets good at cleaning that out, then they um, go to the intermediate level and, and so on. And so the child can learn, wow, this is a great way for me to entertain my dog. Once the Kong is actually stuffed, for me, I love it when dogs learn how to control their level of impulse to get what they want. Um, So I'm not a trainer that's going to recommend any type of punishment when a dog uh, potentially, you know, jumps or becomes too rowdy. Uh, My goal with children and dogs is the dogs think, wow, the child is kind of my, my lucky like piece that I have around in the environment. Whenever this child is around, man, I just love my life. And so I, I don't recommend corrections, but if we do have a dog that is a jumper or maybe the child is nervous about getting jumped on, that's when that baby gate comes into play. So just kind of envision that a gate is up in the, the doorway um, and the, there's an adult with the child on one side and the dog on the other side. And we just kind of wait to see if the dog decides to sit. And the moment the dog sits, we can say, yes. And then gently the the Kong can get passed through the baby gate. And so we can use a baby gate to prevent any physical contact, um, as well as if we're nervous about the dog jumping on the child or the child is nervous about getting jumped on, we have prevented that. I love it. It's just setting up the antecedents, the environmental setup for success. Right, right. And just um, being able to take a breath. 
feeling mm -hmm. calm in this situation because you have it established and under control. Yeah. I mean, and in zoos, they call that protected contact. I mean, there's animals you cannot be right next to, and yet you're still training them. And it's the same kind of idea of like, well, there's protected contact now, there's this gate up. And so everyone feels calmer, right? And safer. Mm -hmm. And then you can wait for that good behavior to happen. I love mm -hmm. that. I love that. Protected contact. That's <laughs> a good one. <laughs> Now, I don't have kids, so I don't really uh, know all the questions that there would be to ask, but it, it strikes me that, like, when you think of, like, stuffed animals and stuff, you know, kids, I know that I still have my Munchichi collection and stuff like that, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it could be maybe confusing for dogs with their own toys and kids with the, is there anything that can be kind of set up with, with that? Is Well, and... I'll tell you what I do because um, the, the seven-year-old here in my home, he has a favorite stuffed toy called Squish. Um, and what I've done is if I notice Sookie, she does this weird nibble on her stuffies. It's either like full on, I'm going to rip the squeaker out and then be done with this, or it's just like a little nibble on, on the side. And I tell, I tell the seven-year-old, you have to keep your stuffies out of her areas. You know, if it's on the couch and she's on the couch with me, you can't be upset if she starts to nibble at it. If she does start to nibble at it, I move it and then I replace it with another one of her stuffies. But I haven't, one, I haven't taken the time and energy to train her. This is yours. This is not yours. There are ways to create some discriminatory um, stimulus and things like that. But but for her, I, I just replace it with something that is appropriate. But I I'm trying to build that responsibility with a seven-year-old of you have to keep your area clean because Sookie doesn't know that that stuffed toy is not her stuffed toy. Right. right. So that's what I do. But what, what advice do you give, Jennifer? I think that's great advice. The, the next thing that I would do is I would make it a, a reward system for your seven-year-old child that's in your house on, you did let me know that Suki has your toy. Um, and it's like, <laughs> good job. Here's a chocolate chip morsel. Or here's a sticker, um, because the last thing that I would want, as well as anybody, would be that uh, that seven-year-old boy tries to get his toy back from the dog. Right. And even without a history of protecting um, something that the dog finds valuable, I, I simply am not willing to risk it. I would rather uh, teach my child, well, okay, uh, you know, Suki, the dog, has your stuffy. I would like you to come to me. Um, and even if for some reason, you know, the child can't find the adult in the house um, because the adult's doing laundry in another room or something. Or on a like Zoom that. call. It's like, yeah, on a Zoom call. <laughs> on a podcast you know, the, in the, the closet. Child, like, the child's <laughs> just going to wait it out and, and not reach for that toy, hopefully, because, you know, they're, they're going to get some type of reward. Right. And, yeah. and, you know, as a family, you can figure out what that reward is based upon what your child's interest is and, and age. That's a great idea. I love that. I'm going to start putting that into practice. Well, I just saw um, one of our coworkers just sent us a picture of something that one family is using that I think is a great idea. So um, they can earn like monopoly money yes. for doing certain <laughs> things mm -hmm. and then they can spend it on you know, like five minutes of, or probably not five minutes, but like whatever, like uh, playing a game or um, a bag of chips or, you know, like whatever the rewards are. But I think that this is a, it's a, a really great way to get kids, you know, in that mindset and start, you know, building some positive like what's the word interactions right and, like yeah we, you know as as children and as adults we all want to learn when it's fun right and totally. it and, and we find a, it a benefit but then also as adults we start eliminating the don't do's don't do this don't do that I told you before I mean <laughs> that is exhausting and so that's why I developed a program called the be a star is to teach children how to show love to dogs in ways that dogs appreciate. And then the, the families, the adults are backing that program up on a daily basis. So we can start going away from the don't do's or, wow, look at what you did. That's great. You just earned some Monopoly money and that's going to go towards an iTunes song for you. Right. Um, and in the end, you're just not exhausted as an adult. Um, you know, you, everybody's bank account is full. 
right? The, the dog has a full bank account, the child does, and the adult does. And when I think about bank accounts, that's like mental health. Right. Um, we're all feeling really good inside. Yeah. So yeah, that, that idea that of switch. the monopoly money is, is awesome. Yeah. That switch of mindset that you're talking about from the don't do to the, yes, I love this. I'm reinforcing this. It's that, I mean, that's so important for dog training. And then I found in my life, it's harder for me to implement that with human training, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's so important and it makes everything more fun and, and it takes away a lot of the frustration because you're approaching it from just a different mindset. And so it's a lot easier to feel successful when you're doing it that way. Right. And um, I'll, I'll thank my pediatrician for uh, this uh, term, purposeful defiance. You know, I, I talked to him about, you know, safety in toddlers and he's like, well, you know, you're, you're trusting that your child will hold the, the railing going down the steps, right? They've done it 10, 20 times before that. You've watched them walk down the steps safely. They're going to have that purposeful defiance one day, look at you, give you that sh- like grin and take a <laughs> step without holding on just to test the boundaries. Right. And so, you know, if we can make it rewarding and in those times where things become passive and we're not there to kind of watch over the environment between children and dogs. That's when those safety zones come into play. That's great. That's great. So I'm going to kind of backtrack a little bit um, for the body language signals. So one, we're teaching the kids how to approach dogs by stopping and and giving the dog a choice one. Um, But then if they do start interacting five years and up, what are some things that you might notice from the dog that's basically saying, I'm changing how I'm feeling about this, or I'm uncomfortable. What are like the big things that kids are a little bit maybe more able to see versus, because I know there's, there's very subtle body language, just like (laughs) that I don't think um, kids might, might notice as well. So one things that parents can look for, but especially ones that children themselves that we can teach them look for this. And that might give you a cue that, that this is too much and you need to take a break. That's a really great question. I think, um, you know, children, they'll, they'll notice the facial features first, um, just because they have a shorter stature and (laughs) they're, uh, face to face oftentimes. And so licking, panting, yawning, um, you know, I look at those as, as a 50, 50, it's like, okay, my, my dog, um, just yawned and it was a big yawn. Right. And then my dog did it again. Well, you know, is my dog tired or is there something else going on? Well, in either way, if they're tired, then they need a break. And and if they're uncomfortable, they need a break. (laughs) Right. You know, uh, you know, the dog and the child are face to face and the dog just starts heavily panting, you know, well, it's 45 degrees outside, Seattle (laughs) weather. (laughs) Um, And the dog was just kind of walking about, wasn't um, running, you know, where the dog should be panting to, to kind of catch its breath or to cool itself. Um, that that panting should signal, oh, okay, well, maybe the dog is uncomfortable with this situation. Right. Um, and for me, you know, with the BSR program and working with children, I'm always say, telling them, you know, if you make minimal eye contact, like you look at the dog for one to two seconds and then look away, um, that's going to make your dog feel happier, feel safer. If you're not face to face, you kind of stand at an angle. Um, and just actually showing them physically um, how to come across as, I love you, doggy. I'm going to do everything I can to make you want to stick to me like Lou. Like yeah. giving them the the tools to um, present their own calming signals. Kind right. Of. I mean, you know, as people, the, the good test is like staring at another adult. Like you're in a consult and you just, you know, you're talking normally, but you're just your eye connection just seems a little too long. It's just normal for us to, to look away. And so that needs to transfer uh, to our dogs as well. Right. Learning that but, dog body language ourselves. Right. And yeah. so the, the panting, the licking, and the yawning are, are, are pretty easily identified on then being like, well, mom, you know, Bali just yawned two times and I'm looking at Bali from afar doing dishes and I see her ears are back and the base of her tail's dropped and she just looks like tense and rigid. Um, You know, that's a great time to be able to call your dog away. Um, 
and do so in a way where your dog's like, okay, that sounds great. Right. Um, you know, and, and do a positive redirection away. Yeah. And that helps build that positive association with the kid too. It's like, you know, oh, I can leave and it's okay and it's positive and I feel better. And so that means the kid doesn't get the the negative association of I'm uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable. And and just having an advocate in the parent and then also having a kid to to recognize those signals is is great. I know with with mine, Suki is is very tolerant. Um, she's not a super cuddly dog anyway. But uh, the seven year old here has learned, you know, if she kind of does some avoidance, like if you go and he always does this, he walks up and he goes, I want to pet Suki Bean you know, and I go, okay, well, does she want to be pet? <laughs> and so he is starting to think about, okay, does she look comfortable with this? And if he notices that she kind of turns her head away or just doesn't kind of move towards him that, okay, well, I'll wait till later. Um, Perfect. And that took some training on his part. Um, and, and luckily I have a dog who, you know, has, has been well socialized since, at least since I've had her with the breeder before that, you know, but but I can tell that sometimes she's like, I don't want to do this right now. And being able to trust him to evaluate first is so important to me because I'm not always going to be in the same room. Exactly. So. Exactly. It's just like um, instilling look both ways before you cross the street. Yeah. And eventually they're on their own and they just know what to do, what actions to take. And if you start young enough, um, you know, like I said, originally it was like three with my oldest. And then I realized they can learn even sooner than that. Um, you're not having to kind of deprogram them from the not so safe interactions that they've been practicing for years. Right. And so that's um, when it becomes really valuable to just teach them the the safest way as young as possible. Yeah. Question for you, because I was I was thinking this when you were talking about how you prefer not to have physical contact per se before five years of age. Say someone has a brand new puppy and they're in the middle of their um, imprint period. So between, what is it now, seven to 16 weeks or approximately, where they're really a big sponge for all of these social interactions they're going to have. If they're in a home with a young child, how can a family go about socializing a puppy to young children without that physical contact? Great you know, question. I, you know, when you, when you have a child and a puppy within the same household, there's no way to prevent physical contact 100% of the time. Um, there's probably when, also no sleep, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> mess after mess after mess. It, it, it's more like let's, let's give our family, the, the humans, um, the thing, the options on what to do if, um, you know, these puppies, they're going to be jumping. Uh, they're going to have some puppy nipping. Their their nails are going to be sharp, right? They have the sharpest little nails. And they're so, just little velociraptors. Yeah, you know, <laughs> we, one, like, you know, we, we want to teach bite inhibition and, and we don't want, you know, puppies chewing on us. Um, or maybe, you know, the child thinks that it's funny, but the, the child doesn't like to be jumped on. And so for children, when the puppy just is acting like a puppy, but it becomes overwhelming for the child, or maybe the child just doesn't want to get their pretty dress dirty or something like that. Um, normally what I teach them is to believe that they're a tree. And so they just pretend that their legs are like roots in the ground. Um, their arms are like branches and they give themselves a hug and they look away from the dog. And I'm hoping at that point that the puppy is like, well, you're no fun. You're not running. You're not squealing like a toy. You're not talking to me. You're not looking at me. I'm just going to walk away from you. And that's usually the, the first approach for if a, a puppy is interacting with a child. Um, and then the next approach would be if that's not effective, that we teach our child how to calmly kind of back away uh, and be able to either get to a parent or to get on the other side of a baby gate. Um, so it's kind of like, no, puppy, you're on a timeout. I didn't like that mouthing. <laughs> you know, I'm going to leave you alone in this room and, and, and let you calm down for a minute and then I'll come back in. Um, but depending upon the age of the child, obviously I might need some assistance with that. Sure. Um, but it's more, you know, with children and, and dogs living in the environment, it's like, well, the dog is in its bed. Let's give the, you know, the, the dog some space as we walk by the bed. Let's not step on the bed, right? It's like, let's, let's create this personal bubble of space. And if the dog chooses to come up to us, well, then we pet twice, right? Because 
they might not be able to stop your three or four year old from touching the dog. So I call it pet, pet, and then you take a pause. And then what does your dog do? Does your dog request more? Does your dog turn the head away like you mentioned with Suki, avoidance? Does your dog walk away? Oh my goodness. I teach adults that (laughs) I was like, when you're meeting a new dog, give them the option and and check in with them. So, right. So, you know, kind of getting back to hands off until five, you know, when you have a dog and a child in the same environment, that's not realistic, but I think that there are safer steps that we can take when physical touch does happen. Mm -hmm. And then once a child reaches that older age of five and on, they're developmentally ready um, and they can start learning safer interactions through the adult. So once you have kids that are kind of that age five and above, more age appropriate to be interacting, and especially now when the kids are home all day, um, I a lot of my clients are being like, well, what games and can they play with the dog to one, keep the dog busy while I'm on a conference call, you know, or just to burn some of that energy because everyone's going a bit stir crazy. And I'd love your input here and kind of your thoughts about it because I, I recommend a lot of hide and seek. Again, it, it is dependent on the dog and the dog's personality and the kid's personality and stuff um, and how they interact. But I love that one because it teaches come when called to everyone in the family. Um, it kind of has everyone running around the house, burning some energy. And then I also recommend a lot of puppy ping pong where they're also practicing that that recall cue, um, which we have, we'll share this in the, in the blog too for this podcast. We have a Facebook Live where we all play puppy ping pong. It started with me and my brother as kids competing on who the dog loved more. Uh, <laughs> so, so those are usually my two go-to games for kids. But what are your thoughts? Do you have ideas for games or how do you manage that? Um, you know, I really like it when we can just kind of eliminate part of their... Uh, the dog's normal ration of food and maybe create a scavenger hunt in the backyard that's fenced for the dog. Um, And so, you know, that might be fun for everybody. And if we're worried about having the the dog follow the child and and maybe getting a little too busty with the child holding the kibble, well, then the dog can wait inside and the child can do that on their own. Um, I also really like the snuffle mats. Yes. Um, which basically looks an awesome like one. an old school, you know, dry mop that the kids can bait around. Um, yeah. it, I should say bait with kibble uh, <laughs> within the snuffle mat. Um, one of the games that I like playing with just children and dogs in the environment. So it's like you have a fenced in yard. It's a nice sunny day. The dog's doing its thing. The child's doing its thing. And then all of a sudden the child just starts running. And for me, it's like, this is a great time for me to try to teach my child how to go from like 60 miles per hour to zero, just in case my dog decides to chase my child. And it just makes my gut kind of flip. And I say, believe you're a tree. (laughs) And then my son just stops. His legs are like roots in the ground. He gives himself a hug and he looks down at the ground. And I just have a party. I'm like, yeah, you did it. (laughs) And just kind of practicing that moment over and over again. It's kind of like that red light, green light. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like okay, no, you can go. Simon play says. Again. <laughs> right? Well, and do you work in training the dog in that context too, of like redirecting their attention at all? Um, with the dog, um, I, I redirect um, in a way where the dog is expecting something good is about to happen, and it's derived from Pavlov. Yes, uh, Pavlov's yes. classical conditioning. <laughs> so, the best way that I can say um, to compare it to humans is, you know. Everybody has a cell phone nowadays. You have a normal ringtone, but you probably have your best friend with a special ringtone, right? And it doesn't <laughs> so matter, <true>. right? If, <laughs> if, if you're in a foul mood, if you're out doing errands, you hear that ringtone and you're just like, ah, oh, now I can just like talk to her, have some jokes, or maybe just get really real with one another and have a, a good conversation. Um, but then you have those times where you're at the grocery store And you hear that ringtone, and you're like, oh, that's my best friend Heather calling. And then you realize it's not your cell phone, it's somebody (laughs) else's. So that's that's your classical conditioning. And so for me, um, I try to condition dogs to either a very unique word that is not said on a daily basis. So a lot of times I'm like, you took Spanish in high school, let's use a word, a key. And it (laughs) means here, and it said the same tone and the same pitch each way, or maybe we're using a sound. So it's something that comes from 
our body, we don't have to carry it, that predicts something great is about to happen. So there's a conditioning process for this to occur. And once that conditioning process takes place, then we figure out um, a way to keep it fresh for the dog's lifetime. But that's a perfect way to, oh my gosh, I'm getting nervous. My dog is chasing my son. I can tell my son, believe your tree. And my son chooses to continue to play. Maybe he didn't hear me. And I can just do this orienting sound. And my dog thinks, yay, Heather's calling. <laughs> or more like bacon or affection. And so it's not only a redirection, but it's a way for your dog to feel calm and to feel happy, which is critical when it comes to creating safety between children and dogs. Um, yeah. Literally parting ways physically, right? Social distancing <laughs> in, in a positive light. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that conditioned emotional response. Like that's, right. I love thinking about it that way. I never really, I love that example of the cell phone ringtones because that's that's very true for yeah, me. Yeah, I think it's really <laughs> helpful for a lot of people um, to understand more about dog behavior and the, the way that I practice when you can relate it to how humans function on a daily basis. Yeah. Right? That's, that's how you create empathy and understanding. Mm-hmm. So important yeah. nowadays for, for everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I just, of course, uh, I love the, the scavenger hunt uh, for food in the backyard example, but this wouldn't be preventive if I didn't also say, please watch out for any mushrooms yes. um, or anything in your, in your yard before you go and do that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. J would be so proud of you, Mia. <laughs> Good job. Here to be the killjoy. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I mean, it's realistic. I mean, we're all here to just share information. That's all. right. Yeah. Well, and I mean, the key to, you know, continued happiness is to make sure everyone's happy, healthy, and safe, right? Right. So. <laughs> but uh, Jennifer, this has been amazing. I know that you have just like a ton more information to share with us. And um, if you're up for it, we would love to have you back to, to talk about more of this. Absolutely. I'd love to continue. Yay. Wonderful. Yay. I have Anybody so many questions. Knows knows I can just keep going and going and going. <laughs> <laughs> it's great though. It's all such like it's needed information right now. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. Well, well thank thanks. you for having me. Well, also I should ask, um, where can everybody um, find you? Uh, so I have a website and a Facebook page and it's just positive transformation, but spelled the cute way, P-A-W-S. And I've tried to make both the website and the Facebook page educational, um, as well as just fun and uplifting. And I think that's especially important during this time now. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah. And we'll, of course, link to to your site and to your Facebook page. Um, are, have you, I'm assuming that you've had to kind of change things up um, and move your stuff to online? You are doing (laughs) virtual consultations. Is that right? I am. I am. And it's actually gone quite well. Um, It's, it's been great because I didn't do group classes before I was doing individual one-on-one training. Um, And so with that um, came education directly from me, but then also handouts or slides. And so that information is able to be transferred virtually as well. Uh, you know, those handouts come in a, in a link and now that can be emailed. And so people can look at those handouts um, like this one here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, as we're covering topics. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and we'll so, link to that because yeah. with virtual and I don't, I mean, if you're up for it, cause I know some dog trainers are, is they, they will do virtual consultations no matter where people are located, even if it's not mm-hmm. local. So yeah. So we'll, it kind of opens things up. This is a whole new world. Yeah. 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 So we'll, we'll share the link to, to your website and your Facebook page so people can, can check it out. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank for that. You. I really <laughs> appreciate the, the time that you've given me. Yeah. No, well, and, um, we're going to have you back as long as you will let us. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess if, for those of you listening, if you have any questions, you know, specifically for, for Jennifer around um, making, you know, your, your uh, dog and child experience better, write to us and uh, we'll, we'll. So what's the email, Mia? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked, Kathy. It's pauseandplay at preventivevet.com. Awesome.
And I already have like a list of questions for Jennifer for next time. Woo-hoo. Wonderful. Happy to answer. <laughs> well, thanks again, Jennifer. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you all for listening. We'll be back with another podcast soon. Take care, everybody. Wash your hands. Thanks for listening. If you've got a question for Dr. J that you want him to answer on an upcoming show, head over to preventivet.com slash pause and play and fill out our form. You'll also find our podcast archive as well as links to everything that we discuss on the shows. While you're there, sign up for our newsletter, which includes tips, alerts, and we even made sure to include some cuteness. It's a treat delivered to your inbox every other week. You can subscribe to Pause and Play with Dr. J on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and iHeartRadio. We'll talk to you again soon.